Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Harry Nahadis. I'm the president of the East New England chapter of the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, welcome to our February chapter meeting. Uh, we've got just a terrific, uh, terrific treat today uh, to hear from some, uh, some very, very uh, key people, especially those of you from California, uh, can very much relate to uh, what you'll hear today, but I think all of us can appreciate uh, the, our guest speakers and what they do. So, uh, but before I get to that, uh, I'd like to say a few words. And uh, first of all, I'd like to invite everybody to uh, consider joining the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, it is primarily a technical society. Uh, however, uh, you know, there's just a lot of benefits to joining. Uh, number one, you get to network with like-minded professionals. I can't tell you how many how many uh, relationships I've, I've been able to forge just by uh, being in this position and uh, and going to a lot of the events. So uh, just a tremendous opportunity to network with like-minded people. Uh, with the membership, you get uh, a subscription to VertiFlight magazine, which is which is really a, just an absolutely terrific magazine uh, that gets you uh, brings you up to date on all the all the different things going on in our in our industry. Uh, you also get, uh, you know, membership access to the different forums that uh, that Vertical Flight Society puts on, uh, culminating with the the big forum uh, typically in May, uh, where uh, where we bring all the all the technical community together, and there's three days of papers and seminars and so forth, um, and that's just a terrific event. And and more and more there are there are other forums that are occurring uh, at different times of the year focused on different aspects of vertical flight. Uh, in addition, you get access to a bunch of different webinars, uh, not much unlike what we're going to do today. So I urge those of you who are considering to please uh, please join. It's a terrific society. Uh, in terms of the East New England chapter, we currently have elections ongoing. So uh, so if you're interested in uh, not only joining Vertical Flight Society, but but being part of the board, that that runs the various events, uh, please consider consider joining uh, either as a board member or as an officer, because uh, we could use the help, uh, we could use your ideas, we can use the energy uh, in our in our East New England chapter. So uh, those of you that are members, you should have received an email uh, soliciting your nomination or vote uh, for the election. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce some of my uh, fellow board members and some helpers today. Uh, who are going to help orchestrate this uh, webinar? So first is is Lauren Trollinger uh, Wolf, who's uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, orchestrating the presentation as well as the the uh, the video. And so uh, you know Lauren is uh, is helping us with that. Scott Hanula is going to correlate and collate all the questions that that you might ask, uh, and he will then ask our guest speakers those questions to make it easier for them. Uh, so they don't have to do all that uh, kind of in real time. So Scott will be doing that during the presentation. And then lastly, I'll introduce Elisa Lee, who is going to introduce our guest speakers for today. And Elisa is a board member of the East New England chapter of the Vertical Flight Society. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today. And so our, we have a gold sponsor today, and that is uh, United Aero Group. And with us today, we are very lucky to have the president and CEO of the uh, United Aero Group, uh, Jamie Gelder. So uh, I'd ask Jamie to say a few words uh, on behalf of the United Aero Group. Jamie? Thank you, Harry, for uh, for allowing us to participate, number one. And I look forward to uh, hearing from our friends out here in uh, California today. Um, you know, we're going to go through a few slides here just as a, a little introduction here. We'll, we'll go quickly so we can uh, get right into our guest speakers here. Um, Lauren, if you could take the controls there and get into our next slide, I appreciate it. Um, so again, I'm Jamie Gelder, founder and president of United Aero Group. We are located in Connecticut, uh, just about two miles from the gate of Sikorsky Aircraft. Uh, most of the employees of my company are former Sikorsky employees, actually. So we've cut our teeth, so to say, uh, with an OEM. Uh, and this, this slide here really depicts our company uh, pretty well where we've got um, you know, various platforms that we support uh, that are pretty much split right down the middle between commercial and military. So we've got any, uh, a number of customers here uh, on the S-76 side. Um, obviously the Blackhawk is, a, is, is our, our, our focus point today, um, but we also do a tremendous amount on some of the other legacy platforms, including the S-61, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit today. 
Um, United Arab Group is um, was uh, was founded by myself and and some of my family members, and I'm happy to report that in 2019 we became part of a bigger company, uh, as one we were acquired by Brightwater Aviation. So we're a hand uh, we're one of a handful of of companies in their portfolio. Next slide, Lauren. <clears throat> so what is it that UAG does? Right, I think that's a good opportunity for us to uh, to explain who we are. Um, so, it, you know, as we hear from our guest speakers today, we're all uh, dealing with an ever-expanding marketplace um, on a number of fronts. Uh, we all obviously share the responsibility of keeping safety first, so I'm sure we'll hear some about that. Uh, and then, of course, we, we have to operate by all the regulatory requirements. Um, our domestic utility and firefighting market continues to grow, and we've actually got some folks that are taking their services from domestic onto the international front as well. So what does that mean for UAG and what does that mean for our customers? Uh, what it means is that we need to develop a way to partner with them and sit in the middle between the OEM and the operation. And that's really our goal and our strategy at, OEM, at, uh, at UAG. Uh, so some of the things that we're doing today uh, with Sikorsky and some of the other OEMs is, um, you know, we are actually the exclusive S61 distributor uh, supporting that legacy fleet around the globe for Sikorsky. Uh, we also have a, a, a primary function with Honeywell on their uh, uh, avionics side of the house. And then we get into some specialty things such as HUP uh, kits, uh, some sp specific tooling, uh, and some other unique support uh, functions for the uh, customers in the space. Next slide. We couldn't leave GE out considering Harry is the president here. So we obviously are, 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 are very proud of our relationship with GE and, and in fact in many markets we lead with this piece of, uh, of the support under the GE umbrella um, you know really what this comes down to here in the US market is as we all know an ever expanding group of operators uh, and then of course with the EDA aircraft coming onto the marketplace uh, it was very clear that we needed an OEM solution here Harry and his team and my team sat and tried to uh, put together a strategy in order to do that and we're happy to report that um, We've now got in place a fantastic rollable pool of engines on the Legacy 700 side, including a, a, a growing um, LRU exchange pool as well. And then we're also adding 701s into our rollable pool as well. So throughout 2021, 20, 22, we'll con continue to grow this pool uh, in support of, uh, of not just our folks here on the phone, but uh, of some of the other operators that are, are coming into the space as well. So we thank GE for allowing us to participate in this space. Uh, we think we're going to be a tremendous partner in this arena. Next slide, Lauren. Uh, a few more little sales pitches here about UAG. You know, as I said, our team kind of comes from the OEM. Uh, we've done some unique things around the world. But really what UAG is is a, uh, is a group that we've put together, uh, various subject matter experts. So it's very important to not just provide parts and service, but there's all these other things that come with it. Uh, which our friends in LA know all about. Uh, sometimes it's a full spectrum of services, right? It's logistics, uh, it's consignment sometimes, it's a figuring out a way to help them uh, with maybe some maintenance teams or some additional technical help. Um, so UAG is participating in, in, in various fronts for, for a wide range of customers, uh, not just on the engine side, but on spare parts, repair and return services, global door-to-door -door service with our, our, our freight forwarding partners, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. And then, you know, share some of our past performance, right? As, a, as I said, some of our subject matter experts have done some really, really unique things around the globe. Um, today, we'll talk a lot about our domestic marketplace, but as uh, everyone here knows, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of Sikorsky product around the globe. Um, some of my teams have done some, exp uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at, you know, various things are on this chart from North America down into South America, all over the Middle East. Um, we're happy to report that we're now expanding some of our uh, distribution, um, you know, into some of these spaces as well. Um, the, uh, the unique piece of where our operators operate is, uh, is really what's, what drives UAG to, uh, uh, to develop our services. Um, it started with just parts, but it usually rolls into much, much more. Uh, we've got some folks that uh, want uh, the door-to-door -door service. Uh, they want repair and return services. Uh, sometimes they come to us even for products that uh, we may not particularly um, uh, have on our shelf. And they'll say, we need help here, right? And we'll go develop and invest in, in those product lines and services. So uh, our job is to really be the general practitioner for these customers. 
on a, on a global front and try to help them wherever we can, obviously leading with the OEM approvals in place. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide just demonstrates, you know, who some of our critical customers are, right? And, and on this slide, as I, as I started with, uh, when I said we had kind of a 50-50 split of military versus commercial, uh, this slide kind of tells it all. You have some operators that are offshore oil folks. We've got some military type clients um, uh, operating in various uh, marketplaces. Um, you know, some of the largest oil and gas, some of the MRO folks, and then some of our uh, restricted category operators as well. Uh, next slide, please. Please. Uh, and then this is, a, you know, really just an example of how we're growing this this network, right? So this is our our network of uh, of various sales reps or offices. I, I guess the highlights here. Obviously, we're in Connecticut. Uh, our sister company is uh, Arista Aviation in Enterprise, Alabama. And then we also have an office in Seoul, Korea, which is quite interesting. Uh, and the last piece that uh, we'll, we'll point out here is, is our partner in Australia. Uh, the partner in Australia is Asia Pacific Aerospace, who is also a GE certified uh, repair center and operating um, you know, in the T700 space. And together with UAG, we're happy to say that uh, we're, we're doing a nice job here on the international Southeast Asia uh, marketplace uh, under the umbrella of, of GE. So again, safety first, uh, distribution kind of second, and then bring some unique services to the marketplace as the customers demand. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Elisa. Thank you for allowing us to participate here and sponsor this great event. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Elisa. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, thank you, Jamie. Let me just uh, real quick. I forgot to mention. So there's a question function in the uh, webinar, uh, the right hand side of your screen. So if you could, uh, any time during the presentation, please uh, go ahead and ask questions, and uh, and then Scott Haniel, you know, will collate them, and and we'll save time at the end to ask the questions. So uh, sorry for that. But uh, Elisa, you want to take it away? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so it is truly my honor to introduce our guest speakers today, Chief Pat Sprangle and Chief Dennis Blumenthal, who are the true definitions of our heroes in committing to protect property and lives 24-7, 365 days a year. So first, uh, Chief Pat Sprangle. Uh, Chief Pat is the Battalion Chief of the LA County Fire Department uh, with over 26 years with the fire department. He's currently assigned to Battalion 5, serving the communities of Malibu and Calabasas. Formerly, uh, Chief Springle held the position of Battalion Chief of Air Operations for four years. He spent over half of his career in leadership roles and key operational positions dealing with incidents involving wildfire, wildland fire throughout Southern California, five of those years directly with the air operations. So previously, uh, Chief Sprangle served as a tax force commander in the urban search and rescue section. And his extensive experience also includes 10 years as a firefighter paramedic, primarily in the inner city areas of Southern LA, um, as well as working for four years as an LA County Ocean Lifeguard assigned to the beach and rescue boats of Los Angeles County. So thank you for being here. Um, and then also Chief Dennis Blumenthal, who's the Chief of Helicopter Maintenance for the LA County Fire Air Operations. He served over 22 years with the Air Ops team, and he joined the team as a helicopter mechanic and was promoted to senior helicopter mechanic and ultimately promoted to his current role as chief of helicopter maintenance for the Barton Heliport location. Chief Dennis is responsible for a maintenance staff of 22 personnel comprised of quality inspectors, senior lead mechanics, uh, mechanics, and support personnel. And as I mentioned before, their support is critical to ensure the best availability of LA County Fire Air Operations Department um, helicopters for 24-7, 365 day operations. So we are very excited to have you. Uh, we've been looking forward to this time with you for quite some time. And I think in order to kick off this session, we wanted to roll a short video. So Lauren, if you could roll it and then we'll toss it right over to you.
Is everyone? No, nope, we're still here. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you. The floor. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you. Well, first, uh, Dennis and I would uh, both like to thank Vertical Flight Society and then uh, United Aero Group for having us and giving us the opportunity to um, be with you this afternoon and uh, speak with you and, and allowing us to share uh, uh, LA County Air Operations and, and what we do. So uh, thank you for having us and good afternoon to you. Um, I think our objective over the next uh, time that we have with you here is uh, give a good overview of uh, Los Angeles County Air Operation, what we do on a daily basis, uh, review our mission and um, talk a little bit about our mission. And then uh, at the end, uh, we'll follow up with another video and then uh, some, some questions and answers. So we'll jump right into it. Um, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit first about our responsibility to Los Angeles County. So our mission really on the grand scheme of things is to support the ground resources of LA County Fire. Uh, that's the engine companies on the ground, that's the, uh, on the, the wildland, that is the, uh, the crews working on the ground. Um, and that's either on a wildland fire or even on a, a hoist operation where we're, uh, we're performing rescue. So on the grand scheme of things, we are there to support uh, the ground resources. Uh, we're responsible for uh, fire and rescue responses from the air. 24-hour operation. We work uh, both day and night uh, operation, which is unique in, in um, some of the world that we uh, we work in or some of the environments we work in, especially with uh, some of the night operations that we do on wildland firefighting. And uh, of course, 365 days a year. Uh, Los Angeles County covers a large area. Uh, it's 4,000 plus square miles that we're responsible for. Uh, with a population of uh, Los Angeles County of uh, 4 million residents. The, uh, the area that we cover is extremely diverse. We uh, go 26 miles offshore to um, the Channel Islands that we have offshore of uh, Southern California. And um, we go all the way up to 10,000 feet up at uh, Baden Powell, which is uh, the um, the mountains that are just north of uh, in, in in LA County. So we uh, quite a diverse area of uh, sea level all the way up to 10,000 feet, and that of course um, brings a variety of different rescue opportunities. Um, it may be uh, transport to the hospital of uh, of uh, trauma patients. It might be uh, uh, transport of sick and in, uh, sick uh, sick and injured for. Um, uh, folks that are ways outside of the uh, um, the, the hospital, or it could be um, uh, fighting wildland fire. So uh, it's a very diverse mission, uh, desert area, mountainous area, uh, rugged mountainous area, and then um, of course we have the inner city also. Uh, we're headquartered at Barton Heliport. Barton Heliport is uh, a centralized headquarters for us. Um, everything starts at Barton Heliport in regards to maintenance, et cetera. We'll talk about that here in a little bit with, uh, with Dennis. And it's centrally located basically in the middle of LA County. Um, and it, it works out very uh, well for us to be centrally located um, as each morning our uh, day starts out with uh, maintenance and then um, deploying aircraft out to different areas of LA County so that we can better our response times. So uh, typically on a, on a given day with three aircraft staff, we'll send one aircraft up to the uh, desert in uh, the Lancaster Palm Bay area, which is in the uh, north area of Los Angeles County. We'll send an aircraft out to the far east end of our uh, area in Pomona. And then our west aircraft will uh, deploy out to uh, the west side of LA County, which is in the Malibu area. And from those areas, we can uh, quickly respond to uh, any emergency that we might be called out to um, on, on a given day. And then for uh, uh, fire weather days that we, uh, when we get into the wildland season, we will increase that staffing and increase the number of aircraft that we have out to uh, uh, give us a better opportunity to knock down fires and keep them small. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll transition over to Dennis so we can uh, talk a little, little bit about our brief history. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's still morning for us, but uh, thank you everyone for uh, letting us attend. It's actually uh, pretty exciting for us. 
Um, we decided we we're going to give you guys a little bit of history on the operation. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, we're into our 64th year, and I did the math. Um, that means I've been here for one third of its existence. Um, kind of crazy. So we started back in 1957. We had one of our uh, local LA County sheriffs who transferred over, did a lateral move from the sheriff's department over to air operations. Well, there wasn't an air operations at the time. He transferred over, he brought one of his uh, Bell 47 G2s, um, and that was the start of what air operations was going to be. Um, his name was Roland Barton, best part in heliport, was very inventive when it came to firefighting with helicopters. Um, I, I can only tell you what I've been told is that um, he truly is one of the original um, inventors of firefighting from a helicopter. Um, so like I said, that was in the 50s. Uh, in the 60s, we transitioned over to a Bell 204s as well as a Bell 206. Um, into the 70s, we transitioned into the Bell 205s. Each step, for the most part, was looking for an aircraft that was capable of um, carrying a bigger water tank. Um, bigger aircraft, more water. Uh, the 80s uh, was was probably the biggest expanse that we had. That's when we moved into the Bell 412s and still operated with the 205s at the time, leading us, of course, into uh, early 2000s, which is when we brought on the uh, Firehawks. Um, as it stands right now, we uh, we have five of the Bell 412s. Two of them are HPs, three of them are EPs, and five of the S70 Hawks. Uh, three of them are A models, and two of them, which we just recently took delivery of, are I models. Uh, to correlate it, uh, the UH-60 is an S-70A, UH-60L, excuse me, and a, a UH-60M, as in Mike, is an S-70I. So that's what we're operating right now. Um, over the years, uh, 64 years, we've had 33 different aircraft come through this facility. Um, can't say what the staff has been as far as operations, but in that time we've had just uh, 37 mechanics. So uh, it's it's a career for sure. Um, that's really the uh, the history of the place. So explain a little bit more about our mission. So again, it's uh, to support the ground resources. Those operational missions uh, would include water dropping for wildland fire, which is one of our uh, our, our main uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, second one would be uh, transport of sick and injured uh, patients. So in LA County, with the 4,000 uh, square miles that we're covering, there are areas that are fairly rural that we need to uh, transport uh, sick and injured to uh, a trauma facility or to a specialized uh, hospital. Uh, so we do that by way of aircraft. Uh, these aircraft are very capable of uh, transporting those sick and injured quickly to the uh, um, the, the centers that they need to get to, whether it be a trauma center, a pediatric center, or what have you. So that um, is, is a good portion of our call load. And then in addition to that, we do hoist operations. So that may be a uh, stranded or rescued hiker. That might be um, a vehicle that goes over the, uh, uh, over the side, over the cliff, uh, that is rescued at the bottom. Uh, we may transport those mm -hmm. patients or uh, hoist those patients and then transport them to uh, um, the hospital. Uh, and that could be, uh, again, a hoist rescue in the, in the middle of uh, some of our rural areas. It might be a hoist rescue um, out of uh, uh, running water. Uh, we do get um, what we call swift water rescues, which are um, a dynamic rescue out of a, uh, um, the rivers, uh, the inner city rivers that uh, folks will get stuck in and we need to rescue them out of there. Um, so a wide variety of hoist type um, operations. And then we even do large animal hoist rescues, which is uh, quite uh, um, uh, unique. And uh, some of these areas that uh, that we serve have uh, large horse communities and uh, we'll have large horses get uh, um, trapped in canyons and what have you after falls and we have to hoist them out. It's really our only option to get some of those uh, uh, types of animals out. And believe it or not, a large animal rescue of a, of a horse or what have you is a huge media um, uh, following for us out here, and, and uh, they, they enjoy to see that type of uh, a rescue sometimes even more than uh, victims themselves. So um, it's quite uh, diverse 
uh, types of rescues and opportunities that we have. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, call volume um, of, of what we do. So in 2020, uh, we did a total of uh, just over 2,000 uh, total missions. That included uh, 1,400 calls for uh, service. And that might be anything from a wildland fire to uh, uh, medical rescue to a hoist rescue. Uh, we went on over 400 wildland fires. Um, with those uh, 400 wildland fires, we dropped over 1.5 million gallons of water with our aircraft. Um, went over 700 uh, medical rescues, which include transport of um, sick and injured to the hospital. And uh, totaled about 130 uh, hoist rescues. And again, that's anything from uh, swift water to snow and ice rescue to marine rescue uh, in the ocean. Um, to uh, missing hikers, et cetera, that we talked about. So that uh, brings us to probably aircraft we could talk about, Vince. Yeah, so as uh, Pat was saying that we did the 2000 missions uh, in last year. So one of the questions I get all the time is how much um, we fly annually. Uh, and um, it's something that I do track. Over the last 10 years, the fleet average, our fleet average has increased as of the last uh, six months. But generally we're flying eight helicopters and we see a total of just under 2,100 hours a year. Doesn't seem like a lot, but most people need to realize that we don't do non-critical flights. We don't have helicopters that are doing orbits and you know just looking for things that are happening. Every flight that happens is life or property with the exception of deployment to those um, areas that Pat talked about earlier. Um, that being said, with the aircraft, I already mentioned that we had the uh, the 10 helicopters, um, but the important thing that needs to be realized is what what has revolutionized this industry is is not just the fact that we're dropping water, but it's how we're dropping water. The the introduction of that water tank was primarily the best thing that could have happened. Basically, what you've done is you've taken anything out of the cabin. So you haven't lost that space. And more importantly, you haven't put on too much of a uh, speed restriction by having a Bambi bucket or anything else that you're um, dragging behind yourself. This is critical for us because we're not just firefighting, we are multi-mission. So that allows us to be able to transition from one thing to the other. Um, for many, many years, the Bell was the only aircraft that we had and it does an amazing job. It, it really does. However, when we brought in the Firehawk, the Firehawk made um, a much bigger difference in the fact that it's got a retractable snorkel system that allows us to hover over a body of water, pick up a thousand gallons in less than a minute, and then quickly transition off to the, to the fire itself. So we refer to it as turn time. So water, pick up to the water, pick up on the next one. So the more often you could do that, obviously, the more water you put down. So the introduction of the tank was huge. The introduction of bigger tanks uh, made it even more effective. And, and as it stands right now, I can't imagine that we would deviate from the current fleet that we have. It is mixed um, as far as the Bells and the Sikorskis, but um, they, they both fulfill their mission quite adequately, if not perfectly. It's kind of a redundant thing. Uh, as far as uh, we also have contract air that we do bring in that Pat could probably talk a little bit more on. Um, since it has changed a little bit over the last couple of years. So during the fire season to augment our, uh, our fleet, uh, we will bring uh, extra aircraft in. Uh, those include uh, two CL-415 super scoopers that we get from uh, Canada. Government of Quebec um, uh, leases those aircraft to us for the uh, fire season. And then on top of that, we will rely on uh, federal aircraft and state aircraft to drop uh, retardants, the, uh, the red, um, uh, check that, that uh, drops from a fixed wing aircraft. So we work hand in hand with the Fed, the state, and uh, the government of Canada or the government of Quebec to uh, give us that additional aircraft to uh, assist during our wildland seasons. So personnel-wise, we'll talk personnel-wise for, uh, for our section, uh, 64 total personnel working in our section. Um, on the operation side, that includes 12 pilots, uh, 18 firefighter paramedics, and 12 of those are crew chiefs, and uh, 
three air captains and then um, some overhead. Maintenance side? Maintenance side, um, Alisa had mentioned it earlier, there's uh, 22 of us. There's myself, two uh, quality inspectors, three senior mecha mechanics, uh, 14 mechanics, and three logistics or support staff, which would include uh, um, warehouse workers, equipment maintenance workers, and uh, clerical workers. Um, it's not enough. It's not enough people for, for what we do, that's for sure. Definitely never, <laughs> never enough. Uh, the aircraft that we staff, they're three-person aircraft. They, uh, they are a, a pilot, um, a crew chief up front with them, and a, uh, a, a firefighter paramedic crew member in the back. So uh, that allows us to um, do all missions of uh, water dropping, voice rescue, and then also the, uh, the two paramedics to help out with transport to the, uh, uh, to the hospital for patients. Um, talking a little bit about our fire season, um, uh, most of our recognition comes from our, uh, our wildland firefighting. Um, the typical fire season for us in California, especially in Southern California, is July to December. So uh, July, it'll start getting warmer and that'll start drying um, things out in Southern California. And that'll last all the way through December, or sometimes January, depending on when our first rain comes. Uh, we do get our heaviest part of the fire season towards the end, which is usually late October, November, and December, and that's when we get our, our famed Santa Ana winds. It's a, uh, a extremely um, uh, heavy northeast wind that comes down through Southern California, dries things out, and then um, sticks with us at times. Uh, a lot of times we'll get these Santa Ana winds for three, four, five, six days at a time and that would bring down humidities, uh, increase the threat of fire, and then uh, once a fire is started in the wildland, it pushes the fire uh, with heavy winds. That's winds 40, 50, sometimes 60 mile an hour winds that uh, are consistent and um, really make it a hard time for us to uh, uh, chase fire, especially the way we build up into some of the, um, the mountainous areas and the rugged uh, uh, areas that uh, some of these uh, homes and, and et cetera are built in. So it makes it tough for us, especially with the low uh, relative humidities and the, um, the high winds, and it makes for busy fire seasons each year. One correction though. So you said July to December is our busiest months. Last five year average shows that June is the fourth busiest month of the year. And there you go. So, so we really have fire season all year round, as yeah. I say. Right. So we never really get a break. Uh, February now, it's still, uh, I hate to tell you guys this, but it's uh, 75, 80 degrees, and uh, we still have that threat of fire uh, even um, in, in February. So uh, it just says it's, it's, it's year round for sure. So uh, we do have a, uh, a, a short little blurb from an incident that we uh, uh, had a, back in 2018, it was the Woolsey fire. It happened to be the largest wildland fire in LA County history, uh, it was the most destructive fire in LA County history. And uh, this was back in 2018. The, the start of the fire was about, and I'll set up the uh, video just a little bit for you. So as we go to the video, you'll see what, we're, uh, um, what we were dealt. Uh, fire started about 2.30 in the afternoon on uh, November 8th, 2018. It started on the west end of our district, which is uh, actually started in Ventura County, which is a neighboring uh, county to LA County, and burned into LA County. Um, that first night it burned through uh, into LA County with uh, uh, 50, 60 mile an hour winds. That allows the fire to spot way in front of itself. So we are, um, uh, it, it, it's a chase to, uh, to, to catch it once it, it does start. Started an area that was kind of rough for us. It's a, uh, a large uh, wildland area that um, uh, notorious for large fires. And uh, we knew that we were gonna have a, uh, with the weather predicted, we knew we were gonna have a, uh, a fight on our hands. Um, this was well into a Santa Ana event like I had talked about. Um, this was probably day 10 of a record uh, uh, drying um, session that we had had. Uh, with RHs less than 5% and again, um, extreme winds and elevated temperatures. Um, so as you watch this video, um, just keep in mind it's, uh, again, consistent, sustained 40 mile an hour winds with gusts up to probably 60 mile an hour winds. 
the incident itself, the Woolsey incident, uh, lasted for about three and a half to four days with consistent firefighting from us. Uh, that's both day and night. Uh, that's with uh, Dennis's maintenance staff working uh, 24 hours a day to keep aircraft in the air. We were able to keep uh, three of our Firehawks uh, um, working consistently for those um, for those four days, and along with other aircraft that was um, from outside of the area, and then uh, the fixed wing aircraft. That's the aircraft that could actually fly in those conditions. Um, the Hawk, the Firehawk for us, was really the only aircraft that was fully effective uh, for that entire time due to the winds and the, uh, um, the conditions that we were dealing with. Uh, the fire itself uh, ended up burning about 97,000 acres. That's about 150 square miles worth of fire. Um, threatened uh, 57,000, I'm sorry, it, it, it threatened 57,000 homes um, in different varying areas in LA County, including um, Malibu. And uh, unfortunately, we lost about 1,500 structures, which um, on the grand scheme of things, the amount of fire that we had on the ground was wasn't too bad for us. Um, 250,000 citizens were evacuated at one point or another over those first two days. And um, I, I, again, it was uh, uh, quite the fight. As you uh, view the video here, uh, most of the video comes uh, the afternoon of the second day. Um, some of it will look, uh, some of the, uh, the, the video pieces will look dark. It's two in the afternoon. Uh, that you're looking at or you know, between two and four in the afternoon that you're looking at and um, the majority of the fire that you're going to watch is the fire coming up over the ridge as it comes down into uh, Malibu proper which is just along the west coast there uh, of Southern California. Um, it's a 14 mile fire front that we were up against and um, at uh, the height of it, it was about 52 mile perimeter of fire that we had um, uh, our hands full with. So with that, I think we can. Uh, one, th one thing to add: um, hours that were flown. Uh, whoa, we lost camera, maybe. Well, if we didn't lose the camera, I will say this: that in the first three days alone, um, the Hawks, and we actually had a fourth Hawk at the time. It was a, a single mission I model that was not capable of dropping water. But out of the four helicopters in the first three days, we put on just under 120 hours. Um, put it in perspective. That week alone required about a month and a half worth of maintenance, all compressed in that amount of time. So I am shouting out to my maintenance staff. I've got one hell of a group of people here. I really do. Okay. And for video.
No. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Wow, that was uh, unbelievable. I tell you, the the scale of those fires is just incomprehensible. Actually, when you look at the, it's just phenomenal. Uh, I actually wrote down like ten questions myself, but I, I'm going to, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, we'll open it up uh, to uh, to questions, and and uh, our friend Scott uh, will will collate the questions and and ask them for us. So, Scott, you want to take it from here? Yep. Thanks, Harry. Uh, Chief Pat, Dennis, thanks for uh, all the stuff you talked about and the videos were fantastic. So I'll probably combine some questions, but um, as we start asking along, there's a couple that came in along the lines of uh, the next level of technology that you're looking at um, and even perhaps uh, using uh, drones or UAVs. What, what, what's the thought process around those? It's certainly coming. Um... The, uh, I will talk about a little bit of technology that we didn't um, that we didn't see on this. Some of the technology is uh, night vision goggles. We use night vision goggles uh, a huge amount of the time for any of our night operations, which allow us to fly up water at night and uh, do some stuff that uh, other agencies uh, uh, don't do or not doing as of yet. Uh, in talking about um, drone type stuff, it's certainly coming. Uh, there's a, a, a perfect stage for it to do a lot of logistical mm -hmm. stuff, a lot of mapping, a lot of, and we're already doing it in our department. Um, and we're uh, working on the, uh, when, when is it appropriate to use drone, when is it appropriate to use our aircraft? Obviously for cost and what have you, but it's certainly here and it's certainly uh, uh, gonna grow uh, when we talk about logistics and mapping and that sort of surveillance um, and that sort of operation. So. Um, we work hand in hand with Homeland Security to do that. We work hand in hand with the Sheriff's Department to uh, uh, and, and LAPD for us to uh, uh, to work on some of those options. But it's definitely here. Good. So a couple here that I want to combine as well. One around um, how you coordinate with uh, Cal Fire and are any of the aircraft used as a de uh, deployment of uh, firefighters, that sort of thing. Yeah, great question. So um, the firehawk themselves, uh, the majority of the firehawks that we send to fires are going with a crew. So that crew, uh, it's usually 11 person hand crew that will uh, uh, be taken to the fire for a quick deployment of the crew. Um, we will put them in a strategic area on the fire. They'll start working and then the aircraft will go for water and, uh, and then come back and support them on the ground. So those are our hand crews and our flight crews that are uh, are working uh, daily on these fires. Nice thing is that uh, more than 95% of the time we can catch these fires when they're small, and uh, we send a huge Air Force fleet uh, to these fires to robustly hit them before they get big. Um, the times when we really have issues in Southern California are in the winter and the windy events, and that's when we just try to uh, increase the number of aircraft going. And, uh, and and pound these fires when they're small, because um, you can see what happens when when uh, a fire like the Woolsey fire gets out of control and uh, becomes a campaign fire. Uh, we work hand in hand with the state, uh, the Cal Fire, and um, the feds to uh, work on our incidents. Uh, the Woolsey is a good example of a fire that we would uh, would put uh, fixed wing aircraft on, drop a retardant, our aircraft drop in water and uh, work hand in hand with them and try to coordinate um, the best attack on them. But uh, thanks for that question. So the, the next one's more operational. You know, as you fly through these, these smoke clouds and the ash, the heat streaks that you're gonna come across, um, what effects do you have on operation? How do you, how do you plan flight-wise for those things? And are there relative strengths and weaknesses for the aircraft that you currently use? Well, the aircraft are, are very well suited for what we do. Um, there, there was a time not too long ago, 10, 12 years ago, where we were flying much lower into the uh, heat plumes, and that was causing a, a lot of compressor stalls. There, there are ways of getting around that. IBS is a, is a great way of doing it if you're willing to take on the weight gain and the power loss. So. Honestly, all we, we ended up having to do was change the way that we actually flew on top of the fire. 
pretty much, yeah. And we're doing what on these on these fires. What we're doing is we're doing perimeter control uh, as dropping water right on the edge of the fire. And then the hope is that the engine companies with the hose lines and the crews uh, with the tools can come in right behind. And we work hand in hand with a coordinated effort to uh, to attack these fires. Um, and, it, and it works great. It's a uh, um, the majority of the, of the the heavy heat and fire is put out by the aircraft and the um, what's left is cleaned up by the engine companies and the crews coming in behind them. So in theory, um, and, and usually in actuality, uh, that is how we're working hand in hand with the ground resources. And then we have uh, dozer equipment uh, um, and other type of equipment like that that comes in behind and, and cuts a bigger line. We're supporting them also with the aircraft. Um, it, as far as, you know, you talked a little bit about the number of missions, but split percentage wise, how many are truly um, firefighting, I guess I would, would call over uh, that type of environment? I would say depending on the uh, time of year. So during the fire season, we are probably 70% firefighting, 30% uh, medical aid, voice rescue, et cetera. This time of year, I would um, switch that around and we would probably be uh, opposite of that, 70 to 30. Fully based on the uh, the time of year in, in uh, and the um, the fire weather. So we have a just a two part question on on how you both approach the role. You know, what is it about the mission that keeps you up at night? What makes you worry? And then what's the other thing that motivates you to get up and come to work? That's you my, want to start? That's my favorite question. question. Yeah. Um, that's from your buddy Bill Neth. So you guys probably. Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, so. I've had the uh, the ability to work in a lot of different industries in the helicopter world. I've done logging, I've done contract uh, firefighting, I've done ENG work, uh, power line work, heavy lift work, and even commercial transport stuff. Um, this is the most satisfying job that there is. We're a nonprofit, right? We're not making any money. So what we're seeing and what gives us the payment is the fact that every flight that we do is critical. We are saving life and property. So that is the very main part of the whole thing. But what keeps me up at night is the safety of my crews who are fulfilling that mission. Um, we are 24 seven. We have mechanics who are here two, three, four o'clock in the morning. We have guys working 24 hours. So the safety of the aircraft and the crews are paramount. And, and sometimes, especially during fire season when we're on a campaign fire and guys are here around the clock. That is what keeps me up. I don't know. Let me add to that too a little bit. Um, it's certainly the safety of the of, of the, the, the folks operating those aircraft and working on those aircraft. Um, we safely, in our organization, we safely push the limits. Um, and our terrain here, our, um, the areas where people put themselves, um, both on a rescue and on fire, uh, forces us to push the limits. And uh, we do that safely and we do that um, in, in the safest way we can, but we're still dealing with elements, we're still dealing with weather, we're still dealing with uh, everything else that comes with the territory. Uh, we talked about um, the altitude that we're working at at times. Um, we were talking, um, you know, poor weather conditions with smoke conditions, with fog, with uh, what have you. And we're doing uh, daily operations where we're flying to 26 miles offshore to Catalina for sick people and uh, transporting them back to, uh, to the hospital on the mainland here. And um, there's a inherent danger that comes with uh, the territory and, and we um, use crew resource management, we use our safety systems to uh, the best of our ability. And um, at the end of the day, it's still, um, a uh, um, taxing, what would you call it, what have you, um, operation. And uh, we always have to keep that in mind. Well, I think Bill and Jeanette could attest to the fact that no one in the world flies these helicopters as hard as we do. Um, we're flying at the altitude, we're flying in the heat, we're flying at gross max weight. And uh, the thing that everyone has to realize is when you're picking up, whether it's 360 gallons in the Bell 412 or 1,000 gallons in the Hawk, you're loading and unloading that powertrain 60, 70 times a day. Um, 
aircraft weren't necessarily made for that. And uh, again, we're, we do push the limits, but uh, it's all about maintenance and inspecting and taking care of you know the, the pieces that we do find that that require work. Certainly, the best maintenance in the world, the uh, the aircraft themselves. Uh, you don't have any better platform to work off of than than uh, for our missions uh, than the um, the Sikorsky Firehawk. Um, so we're working on um, uh, perfect pieces of equipment. Um, the maintenance is impeccable, and then we hire the best pilots in the world. Um, and they like working here because of the mission that they fly. Just ask um, me. Yeah. And, <laughs> so, uh, so to follow up on that, when, when you do hire, that's actually one of the questions here is, where does that come from? Is that from military background? Um, you know, where are you so getting the majority, folks? I would say 90% of our pilots at this point have uh, some sort of military background. And that's uh, solely because of the um, type of missions uh, that were performed prior to them coming that we're looking for. We're looking for the flight hours. And we're looking for um, that type of aircraft flown, a medium aircraft uh, in the Bell 412 and or uh, the, um, the the larger Type 1 aircraft of the um, uh, Sikorsky S-70. Um, the majority of those folks do come from uh, um, some sort of, of military background, usually. I'm pretty sure most of the people in Vertical Flight Society realize that there is a huge shortage of pilots and mechanics worldwide. Um, we run into it on a constant basis. I'm sitting at a chart that I have in front of me all the time where I'm always running at least three mechanics short. There are just not enough qualified people out there anymore. They come out of the Army. Most actually you know, went into the Army, worked on helicopters, all our, our armed forces, um, because their ASVAB told them that's what they should be doing. It's hard to find people who have passion and want to do this as, as a career. Um, and it's even more difficult to find people who have time on type. Hawk is a little bit easier because of the military, but medium bell is very, very difficult and almost impossible to find someone who's done both and definitely impossible to find someone who's done both who's worked on fires. I think the best part about the organization here, though, is that uh, we don't do anything without maintenance. Um, the maintenance certainly is uh, the backbone of, of the section. Um, but with that said, everybody has to do their job. It doesn't matter if you're a pilot here, if you're a crew member, um, if you're um, a buyer for us, if you're uh, what have you. Um, everybody has to do their job and do their job well to um, to perform at the level that we do. And, um, and, and we're able to produce that product. So... Uh, um, it's enjoyable to come here. It's enjoyable to work around these type of people, and um, everybody's kind of on the same page. So I got a couple more questions. Uh, one will be real quick, but the first one will be around the idea of um, that procurement. Are you self procuring your hardware, or is that done through some intra agency activity? No, that's that's all done in house. Everything that's that's something we left out. So um, maintenance wise, operationally, everything is done in house. Um, government contracts, day-to-day uh, -day maintenance, scheduled maintenance, unscheduled maintenance, depot level maintenance to an extent, um, component work, sheet metal work, uh, all the mods, all the installs, everything is done here. Um, there's only a few things that we are not allowed to do, but other than that, it's all done right here. Then uh, last question is very short. Um, is it fresh water or can you use seawater as well? There's no salt water a lot in my helicopters. Okay. <laughs> that, Not at all. When, when you look at the Woolsey fire there, it's uh, it, it's unfortunate we have a whole large ocean there that's just offshore that we can pull all kinds of salt water from, but uh, we only use fresh water. So in the Malibu area, it's very difficult to find water, water sources. That's why you saw them pulling out of swimming pools and uh, any type of uh, water, lake, uh, pond that we could pull from, we'll pull from. Golf courses. Golf course. Yep. Right. Thank you very much, guys. Yep. Okay. Uh, boy, uh, what a terrific presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Sprengel and Dennis. Uh, really, really appreciate your time today. And, uh, you know, very inspirational, and your mission is just phenomenal. Uh, really gave us an appreciation for what you guys do and, uh, and what you go through. So, uh, 
you know, when I when I see uh, you know on the news at night uh, all the fires going on in California, I, I always think of you guys. So uh, thanks again for everything you do, and thanks for uh, being our guest speakers today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And happy birthday to Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good birthday. <again. laughs> all right. Bye bye. Yes.